Hi, good morning everyone. Hope everybody's doing well and has been enjoying the, the summit thus far. My name is uh, Lorena Adriansens and I work as a data scientist in the HR analytics team at Shell, which is headquartered in the Netherlands. Uh, I have an educational background in both psychology and statistics, and I started my career in people analytics at Nestle, where I was also a part of uh, the global people analytics team. So now I'm with Shell for almost two years, and I've been mainly working on topics uh, regarding talent management, leadership and rewards. So if you are watching this session, then it sadly means that I'm having some technical difficulties to get into the live session. So this is a pre-recorded uh, version, which means that I cannot address your questions uh, live. Um, so, but however, if you have them, please use the app, uh, post them there. Uh, I'll attend the chat as well, and then we can uh, get to them when, when they arise. So today I'm going to talk about how we use HR analytics in Shell to get the best of our people. And I'll start with a short intro on what role we as a team play in uh, that big organization and how we tackle problems. Um, after that, I'll talk about one of our flagship projects, uh, Project Spark, and how we use analytics to eventually drive sales performance. And to close off, I'm going to discuss the role of AI and machine learning within our HR uh, organization and give a few quick examples on how we implemented a few of those uh, shiny new technologies. But before that, I'm going to start with, uh, with showing you the most engaging slides you have ever seen. Uh, please not worry, I'm not going to ask you to read uh, this entire slide, but it basically boils down to please do not uh, base any of your investment decisions on, on, uh, on what I will tell you in the next 30 minutes. Uh, and since we are all really into data, let's start with some numbers. Uh, I'm assuming everybody knows that we are uh, a, quite a big um, energy and petrochemical uh, company. We employ around uh, 80,000, uh, I think the latest number is 86,000 employees. And according to um, the latest numbers, we also operate in uh, more than 70 countries and serving 30 million customers. So our operations are mainly divided into four businesses, uh, upstream, integrated gas and new energies, downstream, and then we have underneath all that, we have our projects and technology organization, which uh, manages the delivery of Shell's major projects and drives our R&D and innovation initiatives. The upstream organization uh, manages the exploration and extraction of crude oil and natural gas. It also markets and transports oil and gas and operates the infrastructure needed to deliver those to the markets. Our integrated gas organization manages our liquefied natural gas activities and also the production of gas to liquids or uh, as we call them GTL fuels. In new energies, we are exploring emerging opportunities and investing in those where we believe um, sufficient um, commercial value is available. And we focus on new fuels for transport, such as advanced biofuels, hydrogen uh, charging for battery electric vehicles. And we're also focusing on power from low carbon sources, such as wind and solar, as well as natural gas. Finally, our uh, downstream organization manages different oil products and chemicals activities as part of an integrated uh, value chain that trades and refines crude oil and other feedstocks into a range of products, for example, gasoline, lubricants and um, aviation fuel. So what role does an HR analytics team play in this uh, huge organization? So our uh, mission statement as a team is to help drive uh, employee engagement by providing actionable insights to the HR organization. So from scientific research, it has been shown that if you combine skilled people um, with high motivation or employee engagement and you give them the opportunity to contribute, it has quite a significant uh, impact 
on the bottom line, both in financial and operational outcomes. So our goal is to help our HR organization to become evidence-based, such that when um, decisions are, are made around policies and procedures, we can have more informed and effective decision-making. Practice that can be based on what works, rather than <laughs> what we don't know whether it works or not. Um, and then as a result, hopefully um, improve our credibility as a, as a discipline of human resources practice. We also believe that we cannot just simply replace those beliefs and intuitions experienced HR professionals have. However, we can support uh, or put boundaries on the narrative. Historically, HR analytics has been largely focusing on tracking basic HR metrics or providing reporting to managers on, on headcounts and attrition. However, uh, teams are now focusing more and more on using data to understand every part of how people impact the business value and operations. So it's becoming increasingly important to understand why you see certain trends rather than just observing the trends. And it's important to focus on what the business needs and to make the connection clear between the data and the impact on the bottom line. As an example, it may not be so important anymore to know exactly how many people left the organization, but what is important is to know whether those people left strategic positions, were they highly skilled people? What was the maturity in their experience? What led to the action, uh, to, to exiting the company? The cost of replacing those employees? And finally, how all these events um, affect the company profits? So how, how do we, we start uh, most of our projects? Um, it all starts with the question, um, and that initial dialogue is really important uh, to, to scope projects, uh, to, to understand really what the need is. Sometimes it gives, it is a simple que question and it is what it is, but sometimes it points to bigger problems or bigger issues and um, the scope of the projects become significantly more. Then um, we typically dive into the literature see if there is anything that we can adopt, use, uh, ideas we can get from there. And then we go into the data collection stage. And it's really important that the data collection comes after the initial question um, and not the other way around. So no, um, hey, here's a bunch of um, data. Can you look for some interesting insights? Um, that's generally not such a good idea. So once we have data collection finished and all the data privacy approvals that come along with it, then we can move into our analytics, generate the insights. And then um, as a final two steps, it's going back to the business, have the discussion, sit around the table, get the feedback, and then ultimately um, drive actions. So a little bit on um, our data. So we have our policies and practices and those um, lead to uh, data. Um, first and foremost, we have our demographics. What time did you enter the company? And what salary grade are you sitting, et cetera, et cetera. But next to that, we also have secondary data sources and those mainly come from uh, surveys and assessments. These all go into our system. Then we have our first uh, layer of MI reporting. And then on top, uh, we have our analytics. Um, a little bit on our ways of working regarding data privacy. Um, of course, we always comply with uh, GDPR and other uh, data privacy standards. Uh, when we start collecting data, that always requires a valid business case and is always subject to data privacy approval. Um, and then the report out will never be on the individual level. So it's always um, an aggregated report that women of this category will uh, have the relationship of X and Y and not uh, marry um, <laughs> is at high risk of leaving the company, for example. 
a little bit about our uh, journey. As you can see, we started uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, I was still in uni. No, not even. I was still in high school um, when uh, HR analytics started. So I think the first highlight here is the, the very first one, and that's the data cleanup, um, which I think is marvelous that it happened so long ago, uh, which means that now we can uh, rely on quite accurate uh, historical data for quite uh, some time. Uh, so if you consider uh, starting HR analytics, I, I would really recommend this to be the first step or one of the first steps is to really get your data uh, structures and in order. Uh, and another highlight is 2014 when um, the first data scientists uh, joined HR analytics at, uh, at Shell. Uh, I might be a bit biased here, uh, but I do believe that having that uh, statistical background uh, helps in really understanding and uh, solving of, of uh, these analytical questions. So where are we placed in the organization? Uh, so we report into our uh, VP, HR and data and analytics, which is uh, part of a broader HR strategy department. Uh, and under um, her, uh, we have three big teams. One is, of course, our MI and reporting team, which produces uh, the, the general reports and handles uh, ad hoc data requests. Then we have our diagnostics team. Um, so they manage mainly uh, all the surveys and assessments, uh, including our annual employee engagement survey. And then finally, we have us, uh, <laughs> who are the people that are more uh, responsible for the in-depth analysis on, on topics such as relationship exploration, uh, structural modeling, prediction, forecasting, etc. So I think it's time to talk about uh, a project. So I think um, the first that I want to talk about is, is Project Spark, uh, which was started actually as a frozen middle project. Um, so in our sales uh, organization, we had top performance and then we had a bunch of people that were sitting in the middle that were, yeah, that we wanted to lift to also being top performers. Um, but it quickly became apparent that the project was actually more broader than that and it became a predictive analytics project where the goal was to really optimize our human capital. So in this project we tried to model um, individual sales performance and eventually use that to identify the key drivers of sales performance to understand how levels of different key drivers can lead to increases or decreases in the performance and to ultimately uh, define a path to uh, prove sales. So we looked at many potential drivers, for example, organizational design, um, do we see difference across different channels? Uh, does it matter what type of role you are in? Uh, for example, a key account manager versus a business development manager. Um, does diversity in the team play a role? Um, does the uh, career type play a role, whether you are an experienced hire or a homegrown talent, um, whether you have deep expertise in one line of business or you're more a generalist that has experience with uh, all sorts of uh, lines. Does different learning experience drive higher performance? For example, we have our challenger skills, which are which is a training program, training program specifically uh, targeted to sales uh, people. Um, and then also looking from the reward side, um, do the the KPI bonus scheme does that have an impact on uh, on sales? How did we uh, do that with, with some fun statistics? So basically we made use of uh, a thing called hierarchical models. So that enables you to uh, identify the relationship between an X and a Y variable on the employee level, but also taking into account um, the, 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 the impact of team characteristics or organization characteristics. And you can also look at 
interaction effect does for example leadership have an impact on what the relationship between uh, personality and performance is so i already quickly touched upon it but uh, personality um, it's it's a it's quite a hot topic in sales uh, performance and it's also one of the areas we've explored um, there and for the insight to be directionally uh, directly actionable um, we asked all our sales managers and employees to to complete a personality test that is currently used in the graduate uh, recruitment in shell so this data um, we added it to the the sales performance data and in that way we were able to find uh, or identify a few personality traits that were more common among high performance performers. One of the other uh, areas uh, that emerged during the research is uh, leadership. Um, so we have, uh, I've already talked about it very shortly, but we have our Shell People uh, survey, our annual en engagement survey. Um, but there we also ask people not only how engaged they are feeling at the moment, but also how do they value their team leader. So, and even though it's an anonymized survey, um, we, we have aggregated data on the team level. So we can form an idea of what each team leader's performance uh, in terms of team leadership is, and uh, we could use that data into our model to also identify what the most, whether uh, all in all team leadership had an effect on, on sales performance, and then also look at all the individual drivers of team leadership, which one were more or less important. And what came out of the research is that actually giving feedback to the employee is one of the most important uh, drivers to give, to drive a uh, sales performance. So from this project um, and others, it became uh, apparent that um, that team leadership is quite a big, uh, yeah, has a high importance uh, in the organization. And luckily, we do have quite a lot of high and uh, average um, team leaders. But there is also a portion of uh, of our team leaders that does not uh, perform well in our surveys. And what we also saw that although there is some mobility between characters, uh, between the categories, um, that if you were scoring one, low the one year, your probability of scoring low the next year was also quite high. So that combined with the, the, the knowledge that team leadership is so important for our bottom line, has led us to develop a world-class leadership development program LEAD. And one of the main features of the program is to focus really on, on team feedback. So this is where Project Spark has really uh, had an impact on how we would design our leadership development uh, programs. As the next topic, uh, I want to show some big words on the screen. Um, I'm sure you have heard uh, of many of them, if not all. Uh, there's a lot of fuss around these topics. And um, the question really is, how can we implement it? How can we make the best use out of this? Um, is it a fad or is it really the future of HR analytics? And we are a bit in the middle. Uh, it's between hate and hype. Uh, to say, where we, we do really believe in the potential that uh, machine learning and AI initiatives bring. However, um, because it's so important that we know what is driving uh, an outcome, we do not really like those uh, black box models and we really want to understand still what the why is that things happen. Um, before we um, implement any of these initiatives. We also need to ensure that there is no bias against uh, minority groups nor majority groups. Uh, we want to exclude automated decision making. So um, it should not, uh, there should always be a human uh, sitting somewhere in the middle that can uh, look at the output and make a decision based on what he or she is seeing. 
Um, and you will also see that there's a lot of uh, vendors that uh, are out there uh, offering a lot of these uh, shiny new technologies. But before we, we engage uh, with any of them or implement any of their solutions, uh, we will really make sure that we vet their solution uh, against all these uh, elements. Um, but we do believe that there's value uh, and rather than transforming an entire process at one, we believe that uh, machine learning can offer efficiencies in, in very small parts of the proje project uh, of the process. And uh, that's really what uh, I want to illustrate here is uh, with an example we, we did with our uh, recruiting department. And what we saw or where we identified the opportunity is that um, for internal resourcing, there always was an active effort from a recruiter to source candidates for internal roles. However, if you could identify um, which roles would generate um, enough candidates by, by not having that active approach, um, then you could potentially spend, um, well, spend efforts only where it matters and thus reducing your overall time spent by quite a lot. And next to that, um, if you can identify uh, for which types of roles, it would be really difficult to, to find suitable candidates and it might take a long time for recruit for these roles. It might also give you a more um, real-time uh, perspective on your skill pool health. So, and that can be yeah, used more operational, like can we upskill uh, some sorts uh, of, of, uh, of skills uh, to, to fill the gap, um, maybe, uh, or yeah, also this uh, strategic decision making uh, related to our, our skill pool health. Do we need to hire more, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So um, the tool that we made uh, was a as a random forest uh, tool, and it tried to predict what uh, number of applicants we would have uh, for given roles. Um, and we uh, and that number we can use in a sort of traffic light, right? Um, so we can have short supply and then it's red and then we know uh, a recruiter actually has to go in and actively source for that rule. Whereas if the traffic light is green, we know high supply, not so much effort is needed. So based on different position characteristics, whether it's in what business it was rolled, what kind of skills were needed, um, well, what the type of role was, is it an expat position, is it a local role, in what country uh, would the role be, etc., etc. we could predict uh, the number of applicants. Um, and for this pilot, uh, we use training data for uh, almost seven years, more than seven years, sorry. Um, and we trained our model and then we tested it on one month. Uh, in April and then another testing in August. And what we saw was actually that our accuracy was quite high from, from the get-go, uh, where we had an accurate position, uh, prediction or only one off in, uh, in most of the cases. And another technical advancement I want to talk about is uh, social network analysis. So when you think about social networks, you mainly think about things like LinkedIn or, or Facebook. But actually, a social network is any type of uh, social structure where uh, different nodes or, or persons are connected within uh, with some sort of uh, social tie, such as um, in this example, uh, marriages uh, between uh, rich Italian families in the 15th uh, century. So we can see, for example, a member of the Medici uh, family was married to a member of the Albizi uh, family. So what is the goal of social network analysis is to overall get insight of what your network uh, looks like. Uh, do people have many connections? Are they only connected to people? With, them, uh, with similar characteristics to their own, uh, or there are a lot of cross uh, characteristic uh, connections, etc. And this can give us an idea on how ideas can spread uh, through the organization, or maybe a more, uh, yeah, <laughs> better uh, example right now is how potentially viruses spread within a community. 
And once you understand how our network is structured, you can really use that to improve um, communication flows, for example. Um, and yeah, how do you do that? By identifying who are the important nodes, right? So we can identify two sorts of important nodes or people within a network. One are the central nodes, and those are the people that are really well connected within their own organization. So if you 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 manage those really well, um, and like for example, in change management initiatives, if you could uh, make those people early adopters, then you know that your initiative might be a lot more uh, efficient than uh, if you didn't get these people on board. Then a second type of important uh, people in a network are the uh, knowledge brokers. So these are the people that are uh, both connected with their own organization, but also have a lot of outside connections to other parts of the organization. And could you just imagine what would happen to innovation um, if all those people would uh, leave your organization? So they are really important to, uh, to, to retain. Um, because otherwise uh, sharing grinds to a halt. And this is also something we uh, implemented with one of our, uh, with one of our departments. So um, basically what happened is they had changed their ways of working quite significantly and had put place uh, persons in, in the organizations to, to help uh, communicate the changes uh, and to also like function uh, as a bridge between uh, the departments. And what we did with this network was actually to see whether those people were uh, effective in, in what they were doing. Were they communicating within their own uh, organization or, or were they more uh, the edge nodes that had very little connections? And how did we do that? Not by, by monitoring emails or, or Slack messages, but actually just to go ask people and ask them in a simple survey, who are the most, uh, are the three people um, with the rank order that you rely on to do your job? Um, so by that, we could build that network and actually identify uh, whether those people that were put in place were uh, doing a good job if nobody was overlooked, etc. Voila, I think I can finish with my, my key takeaways. Uh, what is really important is to have uh, the collaboration with the business because that is truly how your initiative uh, will, will generate uh, true value. Two would be to get the commitment uh, of your senior stakeholders. I don't think I have to tell you that stakeholder buy-in is uh, super important. But if you get these folks on board, it will make the implementation of what you are trying to do a lot easier. And also they can allocate uh, resources to the project, not only to help you uh, data clean, but uh, to mostly uh, you, yeah, as sparring partners uh, to get uh, to think along with you. And then as a third one uh, is uh, change management and to, to start thinking about this really early on. We all know that uh, Humans are, are quite wired to resist to change. And it's been proven that uh, one of our cognitive biases drives us to maintain the status quo. So it's really important that from an early stage on, you discuss what certain outcomes can drive in terms of implementation, especially when the uh, outcome does not uh, align with what your stakeholder is expecting. So uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Um, I, I want to ask you once more, if there's questions, please use the uh, chat function. I'll, I'll get to them shortly. Um, and uh, yeah, please do not uh, hesitate to reach out in case anything else uh, pops up into your head. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention and uh, hope uh, we all get to meet each other soon sometime after uh, this pandemic. Thanks a lot. Bye.